This is pre-calculus video lecture number 10 on mathematical models building functions. So in this section, we're going to be taking real world or semi real world situations and creating functions to translate the verbal description into the language of mathematics. So just strategy to put into practice. You want to read the problem carefully. Make sure you draw a picture, introduce notation and then write a function. When we say introduce notation, we mean assign variables to represent different quantities and their relationships with one another, and then figure out how to write a function depending on what you're being asked to do. Okay, so here's our first example. A rectangle shown here has one corner in quadrant one on the graph of y equals 16 minus x squared, right here. So we don't know where that corner is. Another at the origin, so another one's at zero, zero and then a third on the positive y-axis. We don't know where that one is because that one's gonna depend on where x, y is. The fourth one's on the positive x-axis. Again, don't know where that one is. So, part A. Express the area, A, of the rectangle as a function of x. Well, I know the area of a rectangle is equal to length times width, or you could think of it as base times height. And in this case, the base here is going to be whatever x is equal to, right? Depending on where x is on the parabola, what it's chosen to be, this is going to be x. And then the height is going to be y. So the area is equal to x times y. But remember, we need to express this area as a function of x only, not x and y. And this is where I'm going to use the fact that this corner here lies on the parabola whose equation is 16 minus x squared. So that means since y is equal to 16 minus x squared, I'm going to replace y. And now I have a function of x. So I have x times 16 minus x squared. And then go ahead and distribute so you simplify everything out. So area of x is equal to 16x minus x cubed. All right, good. Now part B asks, what is the domain of A? Now whenever you're finding the domain for a function that represents a real world situation, you don't want to just look at the equation and base the domain off of that. Because looking at a of x, you might think, oh, it's a polynomial, so the domain's all real numbers, right? Wrong. So remember, the domain of a, a describes the area of this rectangle. And since the rectangle has to be underneath this parabola, one of the vertices has to lie on it, x cannot be any more than four. That's one of the x-intercepts of this parabola is at four, zero. In fact, if x is equal to 4, you won't even have a rectangle, so that's too big. We can get as close to 4 as we want, but not actually equal to 4. And then remember, we know one of the other vertices of this rectangle is at 0, 0. So you can't actually have x equaling 0 either, because then you won't have a rectangle. So x has to be between 0 and 4, but not equal to. So you would say x such that x is between 0 and 4. Or you could write it in interval notation, 0 to 4, like that. All right, good. Next example, this is a famous one. So we have a wire. It's 10 meters long, and it's going to be cut into two pieces. One piece is going to be shaped as a square, and the other piece will be shaped as a circle. So part A asks us to express the total area, A, that's enclosed by the piece of wire as a function of the length x of a side of the square. So they want us to give the total area inside the square and inside the circle, and they're telling us to call one of the sides of the squares x, or to label it that way. And so if each side of the square is x, then the perimeter of the square is gonna be 4x, which is why 4x is separated there to denote that piece of wire was used to make the square. And then what's left over to make the circle is 10 minus 4x. That's the circumference of the circle. So the total area here is going to be the sum of two areas. 
I need to figure out what the area is of the square and the area of the circle. All right, let's start with the easy one first. What's the area of the square going to be? It's just going to be x squared, right, since each side is x. And then what about the area of the circle? Well, first let's think, what is the formula for area of a circle? Well, it's pi r squared. Okay, but the problem specifically tells me I have to figure out the area in terms of x, not r. So let's see, can I come up with a relationship between x and r? I know 10 minus 4x, that's the circumference, right? That's, the, that's what we call the perimeter of a circle. And what's the formula for that? So circumference is equal to 2 pi r. And in this case, that's equal to 10 minus 4x. Now, can I solve for r? That way I can just substitute it in for my area. Sure, r is going to equal 10 minus 4x over 2 pi, which actually I can divide everything by 2. So this is going to be 5 minus 2x over pi. Okay, so now let's go ahead and substitute that in for r. So area of the circle is going to be pi times 5 minus 2x over pi squared. Now let's clean that up a little bit because this is going to be pi times 25 minus 20x plus 4x squared over pi squared. This pi cancels out with one of the pi's in the denominator. And then I have 25 minus 20x plus 4x squared over pi. So that's the area of the circle. And this is the area of the square. So the total area is going to be the sum of these two. Total area. So we're going to add together. So we have area now as a function of x equals x squared plus 25 minus 20x plus 4x squared over pi. Okay, now you might also see this answer rearranged a little bit to group the quadratic terms together. So what do I mean by that? Well, 4 over pi is the coefficient on x squared there, and we have a 1x squared here. So maybe we want to group them together. You could write a over x equals 1 plus 4 over pi. Oh, that should be a pi. 4 over pi x squared plus the rest of it, 25. Or maybe let's do the linear term next. That would look so snazzy. So minus 20 over pi x plus 25 over pi. And then it's in descending powers, right? Do you see that? Because this is x squared, this is x to the first, and then this is your constant term here. So that's another way you might see it written out, okay? Good. Moving on, oh no, not moving on. What is the domain of A? The domain of A. Well, let's see here. The domain of A describes the set of values that X can take on, right? That X can be equal to. So let's see, what would make sense for x. Remember, x describes one side of the square. So you have to make a square. You can't just say, I'm only making a circle. That's not what the problem said. You have to make a square and a circle. So x can't be 0. It has to at least be bigger than 0. Um, do I have a max, though, that x could be? Well, this wire is 10 meters long. So that means 4x can't be bigger than 10, right? Since x is only one side of the square, 4x has to be less than 10. So if 4x is less than 10, then that means x has to be less than 5 halves. So putting that together, my domain 
is all x's such that x is between 0 and 5 halves. Very good. Now moving on. Can you tell I'm excited for this problem? So an equilateral triangle is inscribed in a circle of radius r. Express the circumference of the circle as a function of the length x of a side of the triangle. So the circumference of a circle we know is equal to 2 pi r, but instead they're telling us to write it as a function of x. And as a hint, what you need to do first is show that r squared equals x squared over 3. Okay, now there's a quick way to do this if you remember some trig and your special triangles because this is an equilateral triangle. But since we haven't gotten to our trig unit yet, I'm going to show you how to solve this problem without using any of that knowledge. Okay, what we're going to do first is cut this equilateral triangle in half. Yes, we are. So this is the radius again. This is some distance I don't know. And right now I'm just going to zoom in on this triangle here that I'm outlining in green. Okay, so I'm going to draw that one again down here. And I'll outline it in green so you know it's the same one. And what I'm going to try to do is figure out what this height is here in terms of x. Okay, so I know this side is x. And since I cut this triangle in half, this base down here is x over 2. So what I can do is use the Pythagorean theorem right now, since this is a right triangle. So I know that the hypotenuse squared, x squared, is equal to the sum of the squares of the two legs, so x over 2 squared plus h squared. And remember, I want to solve for h in terms of x. So this is x squared equals 1 fourth x squared, right? x squared over 4 plus h squared. If I subtract that over, I have 3 fourths x squared equals h squared. Take the square root of both sides. I don't need the negative. So that means h is equal to rad 3 over 2x. Okay, and this is something you might have remembered because this is a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. So the height is rad 3 over 2x. Okay, that's good so far, but remember, I need to relate the radius to x, not the height to x. Well, we're getting there. Now we have to focus on another little triangle in here, this baby one. I'm outlining it in blue. Okay, so now let's focus on this little baby triangle. I'll outline it in blue too. Okay, now let's label what we know about this triangle. So this is R, this is the radius. This base down here, that's X over two. And then do I know what this side is? Well, look back at our original picture. I know that the whole height, let me zoom. This whole height, we figured out, it was rad 3 over 2x. And this piece right here is r. So if I take the whole thing, rad 3 over 2x, and subtract r, that gives me the length of this portion right here. It's rad 3 over 2x minus r. So let's go back, label it in our triangle here. So this is rad 3 over 2x minus r. Okay, finally, I have something that involves x's and r's. Good. Again, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem since this is a right triangle. So I have r squared equals x over 2 squared plus rad 3 over 2x minus r squared. Okay, I have to multiply all that out. So I have r squared equals x squared over 4 plus square the first term. So that's going to be 3 fourths x squared. Middle term is minus 2 
times rad 3 over 2x times r plus r squared. Oh, look at what happens here. Okay, so these r squareds cancel. This 2 cancels. And then now I have 0 equals, well, this is 1 fourth x squared. Ooh, didn't want to highlight there. That's 1 fourth x squared plus 3 fourths x squared. So that's just an x squared minus rad 3xr. Okay, almost there. Move it over to the other side. Rad 3xr equals x squared. I'm going to cancel out an x. I'm allowed to do this because x does not equal 0. Otherwise, don't ever, ever do this. So that means rad 3r is equal to x. And there we go. At long last, because remember, we needed circumference, which is 2 pi r. And now I know that r is equal to x over rad 3. So I can write circumference as a function of x. So circumference as a function of x is 2 pi times x over rad 3. That looks weird. Let's rationalize the denominator. So multiply by rad 3 over rad 3. So now I have the circumference as a function of x. 2 pi rad 3 times x over 3. And we are done. That was definitely challenging, okay? So if it was tricky and there was a lot going on, that's a normal way to feel upon seeing this problem. All right, good. Let's look at another example. So inscribe a right circular cylinder of a height h and radius little r in a sphere of fixed radius capital R. Express the volume of the cylinder as a function of little h. And as a hint, they're reminding us the volume of the cylinder is equal to pi r squared times h. And also notice the right triangle here. Now, if you're a student who writes everything in caps or you're kind of sloppy about switching between capital and lowercase letters in math, now's the time to stop it because notice Lowercase r and capital R represent different quantities in this problem. And so you have to really make sure that you pay attention to notation and that your work matches. Okay, so remember the goal is to express volume as a function of h. And right now volume is a function of r and h. So I wanna figure out a relationship between those two. And they told me to look at this right triangle here. Okay, well, Let's zoom in on it, and I'll just draw it again separately right here. Okay, so here I have lowercase r. That's the radius of the cylinder. This capital R, that's fixed. That's a constant. They, that's the radius of the sphere, and they might as well have told us it was 5 or 2, whatever. It doesn't matter. You're going to treat that as a constant. And then notice here, we have the triangle set up so that it's at half of the height. How do I know that? Well, since this is the radius of the sphere, then from this side to this side is also the radius. From here to here is also the radius. So that's basically the halfway point of the cylinder. So this is half of the height, h over 2. All right, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem again. Look how handy it is. Thank you, Pythagoras. So I have h over 2 squared plus r squared is equal to capital R squared. This is a constant, so that's okay to have in our final answer. So I have lowercase r squared is equal to capital R squared minus h squared over 4. And now we're in good shape. So I can replace the r squared in the volume equation with this expression here. And the only variable involved is going to be h. So v of h is going to be pi 
r squared I'm going to replace with capital R squared minus h squared over 4 times another h. And then that looks a little strange. Let's put the pi and the h together. So v of h equals pi h times r squared minus h squared over 4. You can distribute more if you want. You can leave it. It looks good like that to me. So let's leave it. Okay. Very good. One last problem. So Metro Media Cable is asked to provide service to a customer whose house is located two miles from the road along which the label the cable is buried. The nearest connection box for the cable is located five miles down the road. So here's the connection box. Here's the house. They need cable people. So if the installation cost is $500 per mile along the road and $700 per mile off the road, build a model that expresses the total cost C of installation as a function of the distance X in miles from the connection box to the point where the cable installation turns off the road and then find the domain. Okay, I'm gonna draw the picture again, but without all the cute background so we can focus on what's really going on here, okay? So we have this person living in a house. They need cable. And here's the connection box. Okay, it's cheaper to string the cable along a road. It costs $500 a mile if you pull the cable along the road. It's more expensive if you have to go through the wilderness off-roading to pull cable. It's $700 a mile. Obviously, the shortest way would be to go straight from the cable box to the house, but that would be also the most expensive because you're gonna be off-roading the whole time. It's gonna be $700 a mile where it's cheaper just to go along the road. But then that would be so much longer. If you only went on the road, maybe that's more expensive. So there's a happy medium. Basically the idea is you're gonna need to go some distance on the road, X, okay, up to a certain point, and you're paying less, you're only paying $500 a mile, and then all of a sudden you go, ah, it's time to off-road, and you go to the house, and now you're spending $700 a mile. Okay, and then when you get to calculus, you're gonna figure out where is X? Where do I need to start off-roading? How exciting. Okay, so they told me X was the distance in miles from the connection point to where the cable installation turns off the road. So that's why I labeled this right here X, okay? Now they want me to figure out the cost. All right, no big deal. What is the cost going to be? So the cost is going to be the sum of the portion that you had to pull or draw cable for along the road. Well, how much did that cost? That's $500 per X. Plus, it's $700 for whatever distance this is. Hmm. Do I know what distance that is? Let's call it D. They told me some more stuff about their house, right? This person's two miles from the road, so this is two. And then this whole distance down here is five miles. Do you see? Five miles right here. So if that whole thing's five miles and this is x, this side is five minus x. So let's zoom in on that triangle. So this is two. I want to figure out what D is, and that's five minus X. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem again. So we have D squared equals two squared plus five minus X squared. So D squared equals four plus 25 minus 10 X plus X squared. So D is equal to the square root. I'll have X squared minus 10 X plus 29 and then just leave it like that that's what that distance is and then how much are we paying per mile 
When we're off-roading for that distance, we're paying $700 per mile. So the cost is gonna be 700 times that distance D rad x squared minus 10x plus 29. Whew. Cool. Move over here. All right, you should be proud of that one. Very good. Part B. Compute the costs if x equals one mile and x equals three miles. Okay, so if x equals one mile, you're gonna plug in one for x into this formula, into the function that we built. So c of one is 500 times one plus 700 square root. That's gonna be one minus 10 plus 29. And then you could just punch that in your calculator. You can round to the nearest penny since this represents money. So $3,630.50. And then we're gonna repeat this for x equals three. So C of three is equal to 500 times three plus 700 times the square root of nine minus 30 plus 29. And this comes up to about $3,479.90. So you could see if you stay on the main road a little bit longer and then off-road for not as long of a distance, you save some money there. Okay. Very good. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't do the domain. So what is the domain? Well, X is the distance that you travel before you start off-roading. So we have two extremes. X could be zero. You could just off-road the whole time pulling really expensive cable. And the most X could be would be five because all the way across is five. So X is between zero and five. So you could write it in interval notation or you could write X such that and this time it's fine if it's inclusive, okay? And just as a heads up, the more you practice these problems, the more familiar you'll get with them, and then the setup is gonna become second nature. And you might end up reading in a math book another problem, and it goes something like this. Here's the ocean, and someone is drowning, and the lifeguard is over here at his lifeguard station. And he can run faster than he can swim, but obviously he doesn't want to run the whole time and then swim to them. So there's a happy medium where he's going to run and then he's going to jump in the water and save the person. And it's the same problem or the same setup and idea of this cable problem. It's just reworded and put in a different scenario. So moral of the story, the more math problems you do, you'll recognize things like this and you're just going to train your brain to think mathematically. So hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already.